The presenting sponsor for On Education is Classcraft. We're excited to announce Classcraft's new story mode, which makes it easy for educators to harness the power of stories. Episodes 1 and 2 of Season 1 are ready for you and your students to play today, and it's completely free. To learn more about Classcraft and the new story mode, simply visit classcraft.com slash on education. Imagine, imagine TPT sponsored on education. The people would be like, oh, burn the podcast to the ground. Welcome to On Education, part of the Education Podcast Network. I'm Mike Washburn. And I'm Glenn Irvin. Friends, we have an awesome pod for you today. We will discuss the power of digital formative assessment apps and debate whether we should allow corporations to help fund the construction of public schools. And our guest this week is educator Mayor Cernovac. So I've been dying a lot in Minecraft Hardcore now. <laughs> like like I, I was on a roll and then I died and now I'm dying like within like the first five or six days. Um, I don't know if it's because I'm getting cocky. So I'm like going out and doing things that I would normally have waited a lot longer to do. Um, but, you know, it's not going well. So I'm a little bit frustrated with my mind, but I'm still doing it. Like I I die. And then I sit there with my head in my hands for for a minute or so, and I'm like, "Oh God, this sucks." And then I start again, <laughs> and I I've been doing that for a week, all week, nonstop. I I should also thank Lysander for for um, showing me how to make a shield because mm. I actually didn't know how to make a shield. A shield is a lifesaver. Like it's it's a big deal. I, you know, and actually, I don't know. Hot tip, friends. If you put your shield up while a skeleton is shooting at you with the with the arrows and you're close enough to him, the arrow will bounce off the shield and actually hit the skeleton and cause Ooh. damage to the skeleton. Hot tip. Dang. And the, and for those of you guys never never have played Minecraft, the shield is a new addition to the to kind of the whole gameplay and it didn't it didn't belong there at the beginning there you they actually didn't used to be dual wielding either you could only hold one thing in your hand at a time so it's pretty awesome that they have the shields in there the shield is good it's a big improvement it makes it makes <laughs> minecraft hardcore a lot easier that's for sure the cool thing is when you put your shield up when a creeper is going to blow up you can you can block the like the explosion so even if it's like mm. right beside you the shield will block the explosion so you don't die but uh, I'm 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 getting blown up a lot by like creepers falling from up on high and you don't see them and then they drop down and it's like and you're dead. It's just awful. It's such a terrible soul sucking experience to die in Minecraft hardcore mode, <laughs> and then you literally just start up again and do it all over again. But it, uh, it, it reminds me of the old video games, though. I mean, that's uh, my hard. Youngest son, my youngest son was playing. Uh, the he plays all of the original Super Mario Brothers on the original Nintendo, right? Um, and it's pretty awesome to that he gets to experience that because there is no save, so you get to certain levels and you just you don't get to go back to those levels. <laughs> if you die, it's you over. die. It's really brutal, you know, especially yeah. for us in nowadays as far as in, in video game land where. Yeah, there's a continue button. So you just take risk the lore, you know, you're like, eh, I could just right. continue from this point forward or, you know, so it's pretty cool. I like, I like that version of Minecraft. Have you been playing anything? I just, uh, my normal Hearthstone getting frustrated with it. Um, they have a new game out that I'm thinking about playing a new card game and I'm a card game kind of guy. You know, I, I used to be in college, a big magic, the gathering fan. So Hearthstone was like, kind of right. Like they fit that exact mold, and then now they have this uh, runes of I can't remember whoever, whoever. Uh, but it's a new card game, and a whole bunch of people are playing it, a digital card game. And so hmm. I might try it out. I'll have to let you know how it is. Maybe the next time we talk. And I heard it's free too. So there you go. Nice, nice. I'm I'm going to China in a couple Ooh. weeks, in a month, I guess. A month, like a month and two days the 24th of November and it's a 16 hour flight and it's direct like straight. 
um, from from Toronto to Hong Kong. Wow. Uh, and I'm dreading it because I get I get snaky on like four hour flights. Like I'm flying to Edmonton tomorrow, and that's like I hate I hate it. I hate. It. It, it's not like I'm not f- afraid of flying. It's just I think just between my I have a bad back, so sitting in an airplane seat and just the intricacies of being around people in enclosed spaces and stuff like that is obnoxious, but I need to find some ways to entertain myself. So I'm gonna buy a switch light. Have you seen these these new switches? I have not. They're out. So it's a it's a switch where the joy cons don't detach from the sides. Okay. So it's got all of the controller stuff built right into it. I, I believe it's a little bit smaller screen, but not much smaller screen. And it's cheaper. It's only like Canadian. I think it's two twenty five or something like that. So it's probably one ninety nine US. I don't know how much it is US, but sure. Um, I'm gonna pick up a Switch Lite. You gotta take it with you. You gotta get started take, early then. That's take my it to China. <laughs> Civilization Six is out oh. for Switch. Cool. Uh, Overwatch is out for Switch. Minecraft. I'm how gonna play Minecraft play, Hardcore. Is it what Overwatch? Do they have a a mode where you play against a computer? Probably. No, it would be online. But on a plane? No, you. I wouldn't play Overwatch on the plane. Obviously, <laughs> that's what I was just thinking. I'll probably Minecraft just play hardcore. Minecraft Hardcore yeah, mode. Yeah, of course, you can play Minecraft. Yeah. Speaking of Minecraft, um, Minecraft Earth is supposed to be coming out like literally any day now. I, it might be out in the states. Have you even looked? I haven't seen anything about it. Any so. day now. Any day. So if if it actually does come out, I will immediately download it and yeah, try it out. It was supposed to be like they said October. And it's out yeah. in a couple places, as far as I know. In the United um, States. And not in the U.S., like in a couple other countries, I think. Okay. So, like, I hopefully mean, the end soon. of October is in nine days. So, hopefully it's uh, coming out soon. That'll be super yes. fun. I want to play Minecraft Earth. So, let's get to the news and, and the, the Twitters and all of the other things that are going on. Because there's been, as always, so much going on. So much to talk about. Um wanted to reference a pretty interesting tweet that came up from um Rob Panning I believe is his name and and the tweet is uh, I'm going to I'm going to read it mostly word for word public schools equal public goods and they should not be for sale corporate slash wealthy philanthropy is a euphemism for privatization and tax avoidance and also a way to crush freedom of speech. So I believe that they're referring to things like the naming rights uh, on on high schools. Yes. Which seems really, I, I mean, we've talked about corporate sponsorship. Yeah. We've talked we about we how, talked about, this. about how, you know, in some cases, you can see it being a relatively good idea. And we I brought up, I referenced, for example, Epic Games or Unity or some some big computer slash tech company sponsoring or providing support to computer science teachers and, and funding computer labs as a, as a decent example. But naming yeah. rights for high schools, Glenn? The biggest thing about this thing, I mean, first of all, it, it's local. So it, it, this was in the Star Tribune from the Twin Cities. And this town, Owatonna, is uh, just a south central Minnesota town. And they had this bond basically that the local voters, you vote for these bond issues. And uh, you basically, if you prove it, you, you say, yes, we're going to raise our property taxes by a specific amount. And they narrowly rejected their bond issue, which the bond pays for this new school. And it got rejected 50.5 to 49.5%. So there was a 1% uh, vote that killed it. Hmm. And so they have this school and they're like, so what are we going to do? We need to, we need to build a school. You know, there's a specific reason for it, whatever it might be. And a, uh, basically a business, a corporation said, we will go ahead and, and put money towards it. And then, they will have the naming rights or some sort of rights to the, you know, to the name of the school or whatever it might be. And that seems to high fire, school. Yeah. So it seemed to fire up some people. And I, and I think it's actually, as I look, as I read through the article, it did say that it was a, 
a, a local business kind of uh, yeah. uh, industry. Do you know what I mean? So it's not like okay. Walmart, <laughs> Walmart High School or something like that. Right. Um, but it could be. I mean, that's what we're that's what we were just talking about. We don't know what what the implications of something like this, but understand though that the school is in a bind needs this to replace the school was a hundred years old mike is a hundred year old high school that needed to be replaced and the voters rejected it so then i mean whether or not um you know rob here is angry about it or whatever might be got to understand we need to replace the school. <laughs> so how yeah. do you actually do it if someone says hey we're going to contribute monies towards it is there something you know, uneasy about that. Absolutely. But it's, it's the reality, you know, and if you, as a school board, uh, you know, the superintendent, it is as the school board members, what do you do? So you say that, you know, the, the business is actually funded and I think they funded 25 million of, of the amount, um, to, to help fund the new high school. And so it's crazy. It's crazy, but it's the reality of what's happening. And and just like we've talked about before, local tax and bond issues, all of these issues that we vote for locally are so important and so important that us as educators get out and, and basically educate people on what these monies go out towards. Because a lot of people think that we just are wasting these monies. By we, I mean educators, the district, school district, we're just, you know, uh, spending the money frivolous, frivolously, right. and that's actually not a reality. Uh, uh, you know, many times these types of things need to, you know, obviously a, this is a bond for a building. Uh, whether or not you need money to be able to go in and run the school, you know, if you're passing a specific type of, of thing there. So, yeah, I I think it's super interesting, and it's going to be a conversation that I think continues to happen. It will continue to happen until schools are funded appropriately, you know, and and that's not by. Uh, specifically only by local taxpayers, but we help by funding them uh, at the federal level too. So friend of the pod, Carl Hooker, wants to know what's more damaging to kids' brains, interacting and creating with a screen or reading a paper textbook and doing a worksheet? That was a question he posed on on Facebook the other day. I took a screenshot of it. It's generated quite a, a pretty interesting conversation on on Carl's um, Facebook feed. Um, and and I'm curious what you what you thought of this. Um, what is more damaging to kids' brains: interacting and creating with a screen, or reading a paper textbook? And doing a worksheet, I, I I kind of honed in on the wording of it, maybe a little more than I should, and maybe it's not worded exactly the way he was asking, because damaging is an interesting word in this in this sentence. Interesting, yes, because right. because I, I don't <laughs> I don't think either are damaging, right? It's brains, I, I but I do know that certain people believe that if you uh, are working on a screen, a digital screen. That that is some that somehow that's going to affect us negatively, right. and it will obviously if that's all you ever do and you spend excessive amounts of time on a screen, it does it will affect you, uh, especially kids. Uh, the choice here, I, I I just honed in on one word, which is the word worksheet, because the paper textbook I still believe in you know textbooks, um, and by textbook I actually took it as a book. <laughs> that it's a a book <laughs> that's made out of paper you know what i mean literally uh, a book yeah a but if it's an actual textbook coming from like uh you know whoever it might be hugh and mifflin or pearson or whoever it might be i i i know what he's getting at is it is yes and interacting with the screen is not damaging to any, any kid's brain <laughs> i'm sorry it's not and so yeah if you think that that's a reality as far, especially if they are creating uh, within the th- within the uh, platform, whatever might be the device, um, that's fantastic. If someone is doing a worksheet, especially if it's mindless, it's just what we usually associate w- uh, with a worksheet is, is things that are regurgitating information. They are not mm-hmm. creation. They're just regurgitating facts or whatever might be. I don't think that damages a kid's brain, but it certainly yeah. doesn't help to, doesn't help in, in the learning process. So, um 
it's an interesting question. Yeah. <laughs> I, know, I know what he was trying to get at is it is like a lot of people are burning or like get angry because kids are using digital devices. Um, and why don't they just go back and, and do normal work with textbooks? There's a time and a place for everything. We've talked about that on the, on the show too. Uh, but truly thinking that the screens are going to do damage. I don't think so. The, the worksheets I think are worthless like 99% of the time. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting thought process and I'm sure there's a lot of uh, great responses to this. When, so I thought of two things when I thought of this. Um, the first thing I thought of was, did you ever see the video on YouTube? Um, and they showed this in a lot of like pre-service classes. I, I remember seeing it the, for the first time when I was doing my bachelor of education. Um, and it's and it's the video if if books were invented after video games mm. is the is kind of the the name of the video and and it's a guy talking about what how people would react to books if video games had come first and they would be like there would be like this reaction where it's like what is this thing that you can't interact with that you can't um, you know, that you can't create, that you can't use your imagination, that you, you are a passive, you know, you're just sitting there reading, looking at words on pages. It's so boring compared to, to the amazing things you can do in video games. And I, it made me think of that video for some reason. I'll, I'll link it in the show notes if I can find it. Because I, 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 I think the, the way that he talks about it is, is really, really kind of funny. Um, it also made me think about, um, you know, the idea that, you know, context is everything, usage is everything, the way that a textbook is, is used, it, it's all in the hands of a good teacher, anything is powerful, any tool is powerful, any method can potentially be powerful. Um, I would agree that you know, all things being equal, a worksheet is probably the last thing that I would choose, though, um, because there are so many better choices for things that you could probably do instead of doing whatever that worksheet is. Sure. So when faced with choice and options, you know, I think that I think that I would choose interacting and creating with the screen than reading a paper textbook or doing a worksheet. I feel like that's, I feel like that should be a little bit more of a no brainer than it is mm -hmm. uh, for sure. So a couple interesting articles came across our desks this week. One from Edutopia six tips for managing the feedback workload. Providing feedback is proven to increase student learning. Um, and there's some ideas on, yeah, it's funny actually. I talk about this in my keynote about about how I did this amazing video assignment. I, I thought I had all hit all of the sweet spots for like what an awesome teacher is supposed to do. You know, I had student choice, I had student voice, I had this whole aspect of creation, I had all of these things, and then I didn't realize that I had to watch eighty five minute videos and assess them and then yeah. give kids i mean and it killed me it was the like it was it was devastating in terms of like the effect that it had on me in terms of how much time it took to 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 assess them and to give students grades and then to give them feedback and and stuff like that um and and i think that you know there's ways that we can do this better right this is this is kind of your wheelhouse too right this is this is what you do probably in, in a lot of your work. Yeah. And I, I think the, the most important tip, and this is anytime I'm talking to anybody about feedback and it, and it makes it clear in this article, I think it's number six, as far as on the list here, but the most important thing is that the feedback be timely. And that's what you were realizing too, when you had to sit down with these ginormous videos and an enormous workload that you just that you just threw onto yourself but yeah. you didn't realize that that was that that was going to be the effect of that um that you wouldn't be able to give timely feedback and even the feedback that you were going to give it was going to take you epic amounts of time you know of your life taken away and mm -hmm. then the 
feedback that you're able to go ahead and give them probably wasn't in, you know, in time, you know, as far as to be no, able to. No, it wasn't. You know what I mean? It took, to me, it took, to me, it. It took me over a month to assess all those. <laughs> I know. So, so, you know, when you talk about uh, AJ Giuliani, for example, yeah. right? And, and you talk about how uh, profound it is just the statement to say when you're doing project-based learning or when you're just giving any kind of feedback to anything, do it, as it says here, in smaller chunks at, at during the process. So mm-hmm. like you talked about like grading the process. You've said that several different times and how amazing just to think about this. Like, yeah, that's exactly what we should be doing. Well, that makes the biggest difference. And that actually should it would be- would have meant everything. <laughs> Exactly. It would, would have been everything. Yeah. When we give feedback during that entire thing, you know, uh, uh, then of course it will make a difference in the students' learning. It's it's the reason why me and you know this, Mike, because we're video game nerds, why video games are so dang powerful because we get instantaneous feedback and constant yep. feedback in a timely manner. Yep. We make mistakes we know that those mistakes are made immediately, you know, and, and so, and then you would learn from those things and you continue to go ahead and work through those things. You get that instantaneous feedback. And that's exactly when, when you're in classes where you can, you can depend upon the feedback to come in and it's actually timely and it's valid. You know, it's not just like, Hey, good job or whatever might be, you know, kind of those things. It's like specific. Actually, that's, that's a better word. Uh, it's timely and specific. You're going to make a difference in, in kids' learning and, and uh, I, that that would be the, my biggest uh, takeaway from this entire article. And anytime you're talking about feedback itself, a pretty interesting article made its way to Forbes this week. Ten common ed tech marketing mistakes: what tech companies get wrong about selling in education. And we've obviously we've talked about this a lot. Yes, um, you know we we we've we have my classic hot take about uh, Apple and Microsoft and Google. And you know what they're what they're doing good, what they're doing well, and what they're getting wrong. And we've talked about, for example, communities and the 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 the, the teacher communities that a lot of these um, groups create uh, as marketing funnels for you know advocacy and and stuff like that. Um, and there's there's a lot of you know one of the things I think why this resonates with us is because you know in some worlds you and I would be considered influencers for example um, we certainly have um, ed tech companies that sponsor the podcast um, I think we're really in tune with this world um, we both work and deal with ed tech. I work for an ed tech company. For God's sake, I mean, I mean, in reality, um, you know, so so I think that this is something we're we're really in tune with. So a lot of this, um, a lot of these ideas resonated with both of us. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And and I mean, the article really lays out to companies that want to step into this space, like kind of what mistakes did not, you know, kind of avoid these things because you will be called out on it. Basically, that's kind of what it's talking about is it goes down the list of, of of things that people make as far as mistakes. Now, you're exactly right too, Mike, is if you can get, if you have a really good product and the best endorsement you can have is educators who use your product yep. and then endorse it. Basically, they say, hey, here's the product, here's how I use it. And maybe even like, you know, we both do and, and we have in the past create uh, you know, tutorials about it. And we're so excited about it that we want to show other people how we use it, uh, lesson mm-hmm. plans that we share with this specific tool and how you would be able to go ahead and do the same thing. That's the biggest marketing thing. And really the companies, I, I think a, a lot of times miss out on that, on that specific market, you know, that, that, that really reach out to teachers that are using their products and then, and then be able to say, Hey, let us know more about what what it is that we're doing well. What do we need to work on? Those kinds of things, and and really work their marketing through the lens of actual teachers, the people who actually are using the products themselves. But it gives a lot of great advice here about basically don't go out there and try to you know be a thought leader you know <laughs> as a company or you know 
we help motivate teachers, you know, those kinds of statements. It's, it's uh, all of those types of things will get called out. We've seen it, you know, on memes and whatever else it might be and, yep. and try to avoid those things. That's what I would say as far as any of these types of companies or representatives of these companies and really reach out to your base, you know, to your uh, the people who use your products and figure out what is it that they need and want. Um, like a little company, this is who, this is who people can really learn a lot from. That kid who invented GimKit, he has done so much research, active research with his, the people who use his product. And mm -hmm. that's how he has continued to grow his company and basically change his game based upon the feedback he's getting from the teachers and the students who are playing the game, which is, I mean, talk about how you're supposed out. to do it. Yes, exactly. Yes. And, and I mean, if he was a student in your class building that, those games, this is the iteration process that you teach, Mike, as far as how to how to go about, you know, creating an app or a game and then making it better and better and better each time you you you, you iterate uh, and you go through the process. Totally. One of the one of the things I thought of when you were talking just a second ago was how so I I do I work for an ed tech company. I do professional development. That's my job. Um, yeah. one of the things that I've tried so hard to do in my job is differentiate me and my role at Logics Academy from the sales process. Mm. Much to, for example, much to the dismay sometimes of our sales guys who, who would love if I pushed product and, you know, handed out Keith, handed out our business cards and, um, stuff like that a little more often. But, yeah. you know, the thing is, is that I I tell people all the time, I so every time, as, as soon as someone asks me how much something costs, for example, yeah, I do, I do this little bit of a, a, a spiel because I'll, I'll be honest, and if this isn't a word of a lie, I don't know how much most of our products cost. I couldn't tell you how much we sell a dash for right now. Okay. I don't know. And I, I do that on purpose. Again, much to the dismay of some of our, our our employees, I do that on purpose because I don't want people to think I'm trying to sell them something. And and so I, I say I say to people all the time in professional development when I'm when I'm talking to teachers, when I tell you that I think something is great, I want you to believe it's about credibility. So it's about them believing that I think this is great because I think it'll help you in your classroom. Yeah. Not that I think it's great because I think you should buy it. I gotcha. think if you trust me to give you good advice, I think if you rely on me for how you're going to work in your classroom, that sales will take care of itself. Yes. That, that our company's business will, will prosper um, and that my job will be secure because you trust me to give you the right advice, not try to just sell you a robot or an accessory or a whatever. So okay. I, I consciously do not keep up to date on sales in terms of like if we have promotions or offers. I very rarely will push or talk about like new products. And frankly, I didn't do sessions like product specific sessions until yeah. recently. And the only reason I even started doing, so I do this session on this, this coding platform called Metadalab for K to two kids. The only reason I do it is because I think it's freaking great. And that I think every K to two classroom should have one. It's not necessarily that I care whether you buy it or not. I think K to two coding is a space that no one pays attention to. And mm. this is a game changer. Like it's, I, but I, I still don't know how much it costs. Like I, I, I'm telling you, I, they ask me how much it is in the session because yeah. I do it all the time right now. I've been doing this session quite a bit. I don't know. I, I, no, I, I no think idea. it's in the no between costs. 200 and 300 bucks Canadian, but I honestly don't know how much a Metalab costs people. Um, yeah. You're going to have to look it up because I don't know. And I tell them that all the time. I don't know. Don't ask me how much things are like, you know, I can tell you the website it's logicsacademy.com go and take a look but I don't know how much something costs yeah. so don't ask 
because you know and i think that that's part of my credibility as 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 an educator as a pd specialist and as 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 the face more or less of this company is that you know i want people to think that i'm there to help them in their classrooms and they can't do that if they also think i'm trying to sell them robots yeah and so um if if we you know just take rules from this this is a great article people should definitely like ed tech companies read this because it is very good advice on how to treat your clients your customers which are educators with respect and to to um uh you know i think your sales will improve um, when you do these things, even if they are not directly tied to you actively selling whatever it is you're trying to sell. Um, when we come back, um, Glenn, listen, when Glenn Irvin tweets, the world listens and, <laughs> and Glenn um, asked a question on Twitter the other day, what are our top five digital formative assessment tools? And the world responded in, in typical uh, fashion. And we're going to talk about our top five digital formative assessment tools when we come back. So stay with us. On education is brought to you by fresh grade. The reality for most classrooms is that besides open house and parent-teacher conferences, there's little communication and interaction between teachers and parents. FreshGrade Next wants to change that by bringing teachers, parents, and students all together with a set of new tools for posts, activities, comments, and class feeds. Take communication in your classroom to another level with FreshGrade Next. To learn more about FreshGrade Next and sign up for your free account, visit freshgrade.com. On Education is brought to you by Sourcewell Technology and the Impact Education Conference. Join Jimmy Casas, Angela Myers, Michael Cohen, Jordan Shapiro, the On Education podcast team, amazing featured speakers, and thousands of educators December 14th through 17th in Minneapolis, Minnesota for the region's best education conference. Register now using promo code ONEDUCATION2019 for $30 off your registration. Also, with every registration, you'll receive a free book of your choice from one of the amazing speakers. To register for the conference, visit impact.sourcewelltech.org. That's impact.sourcewelltech.org. All right, welcome back to the podcast, everybody. This tweet heard around the world, or just, you know... A few of us, <laughs> uh, but it was a good conversation, um, and and I thought, you know, this is the perfect thing. This is this is what we like to talk about. This is our wheelhouse. What are the top five digital formative assessment tools available for teachers? And then you put in brackets, and, and uh, that have to be free or that are free. So I guess that's a caveat. Um, you know, we got a lot of great responses. Um, I, I I think it'd be fun to go through some of the responses, um, but then let's see if we can if we can nail it down. I don't know if we can nail it down to five. Five is tough. But let's... I think we should we should go back and forth and choose one, and then and then like I choose one, you choose one. You know what I mean? Hmm. Until we get number five, and okay. then we can both. Do they have to be free? Yes. I mean, they have to have a free version. A free version. Least, you know what I mean? Because because obviously, like Nearpod has a free version but then there's a paid version okay so that's your first one uh well yeah <laughs> so i think we knew that and we i think we also know my first one yes <laughs> go ahead and say it <laughs> so so and I, I i think i i mentioned it in here so i mean explain everything seems yes. seems like it belongs on this list there is a free version of explain everything um, and you can do anything with explain everything. So, um, <laughs> that is a commercial, everybody. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know why they're not a sponsor. They, they, they don't need to be, I guess is the whole point. Yeah, exactly. Which is ridiculous. I should stop talking about explain everything. I guess is what <laughs> same thing with Nearpod. I, I right. talk about them all the time and they're not a sponsor. <laughs> Nearpod slide into our DMS. What the hell? Let's go guys. <laughs> Okay. Come on. So this is it gets more difficult now. So we've got we've got Nearpod and Explain Everything. I I'm happy with those two. Um it, I think that there's I think that there's a a definite number 3. 
Okay. Um, do you want to, but you, okay, you go next. Cause I, I think we might be on the same page about what number three might be. I think number three, you, you, you these aren't to... in order though. We can't like, these can't be in an order because yeah, no, they're not just, in any just order. the third one we're thinking of the third one we're thinking of. I was thinking Flipgrid. There it is. Yeah. Just, it's just, it's free. Yep. There's honestly a million things you can do with it. Yep. And as we even, you know, we were, uh, Speaking to Adam, um, and and Cosmo. Sorry, uh, Adam. oh my goodness, I give you a big hug because I just forgot him <laughs> there. But anyway, we were speaking to them, and they were giving us example after example. Yeah, interviewed them of different ways that people have found to use Flipgrid. It is free. It is amazing. You can embed it in anything, and it's got to be number three. I think. I mean, not on the top, but just one of the top five. I would say. Yeah. Hundred yeah. percent. I we were on the same page. I I I feel like I feel like I knew that was going to be. I was comfortable. Yeah. Uh, I, now I, it's interesting because now yeah. there's a ton of other things that are out there, and a lot of them are really really good, and a lot of them kind of fit into a specific like subcategories. If you would agree with me here, so this a subcategory of formative assessment apps would be like um, what I would call. Uh, uh, well, I think we can game, game apps. It might like, it game, might be easier. Okay, so yeah. it might be easier to lump yeah. like like they may not like this, but we're going to do this because we can. Yeah. I I think it's fair to put Nearpod and Pear Deck in generally speaking the same category. They are they are very similar, the same marketplace, and they do a lot of the same things. Sometimes mm-hmm. they things a little bit differently, more powerful one way or the other, you know, yeah. but yes, you're right. They are in the same, uh, you know, space. So yes. then in the, so, so I think Flipgrid is unique. There's, there's not it's, really anything that's doing what Flipgrid yeah. is doing. Yeah. And what was, what was two? So we had Nearpod and ex- so there's not really anything like, that's doing what explain everything can do as well. There are interactive whiteboard apps, Yes. Um, but, but they don't do it. Like you can't record video in most of them, which is what you can do with explain everything. You can't create video in most of them, which is what you can do and explain everything or audio, for example, like you could use explain everything as a podcasting app, for example, if you want it to. Yeah. And, and I was just thinking about that. The only competitor against explain everything. And I don't know if everybody knows this is the new shorts app in Flipgrid, <laughs> which again is Flipgrid again. It has some uh, capabilities. It's not as robust, obviously. Explain everything. If you guys haven't checked it out, especially using an iPad, it's ridiculous. It's, yeah. I, I mean, literally, it is ridiculous what it actually can Glenn do. makes fun of me, but he likes it, obviously. I do like it, exactly. Um, and it, it is unique in, a, in that space. So uh, I, think, I think in the fourth spot, we can lump together like all of these quiz slash... Quiz, yes. Like, like game... So Quiz so we're talking apps. like Quizlet, quizzes, yes. Gimkit. Yes. Um yes. uh there's there's what is the what are the other ones? There's a couple more. There's Kahoot. Kahoot. Quizlize is another one. Yeah. There is eh, there's probably other ones. I mean, I, I know there's like an app called Socrative. I don't see yep, it as I've a, used Socrative before. Yep, I don't see it as a game kind of thing, but it's more like an exit ticket kind of developer, those kinds of things where yep. you can do those. Um so any a lot of those are fairly interchangeable. G- Gimkit has some like the the currency um, type model. Is that yes. is that not what they have? Yes, they do. So there's 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 differences in them, but they're all kind of generally doing roundabout the same thing. They're fairly they're all in the same space, and they're super popular. Yeah. So and if you want a, a like a game show quiz kind of app there's a lot of really really good ones we love gim kit we just love the story yeah and we the love story is great uniqueness too it's unique to that specific market but all the other ones are great too and a lot of people use cahoots you know obviously so i i feel like in the fifth spot so if we have to do a top five now there are okay. there are lots of things that we're not gonna mention or we'll we'll give honorable mention but i feel like the top five the fifth spot has to go to things that are similar in terms of student documentation in terms of like, like things like um, um, Google 
like Google Slides, like Google Keep, um, yes. Evernote, Notability. Um, Andy Lizer, friend of the pod, mentioned Seesaw, which is a, another great kind of documentation app. Um, anything where kids can do kind of reflection and journaling and 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 kind of kind of like ongoing reflection of their work. Yeah. And I feel like you can do with that in a lot of different interesting ways. You could use Schoology for that. Schoology was brought up. You can use, frankly, you could use any LMS to write like a journal or a blog. But I know that Schoology actually literally has a blog module uh, yes, within it. So um, anything that you can do like kind of like journaling or ongoing documentation would probably in my mind have to be the fifth kind of category of tools. And there are a few that, that can be put into that. What do you think? Yeah, no. And I was, I, I totally agree with you. And what it really brought to light as people were giving their suggestions is that there's just so many ways to do formative assessment. And then really then it brought a discussion about, you know, do you actually need the digital tools to do the formative assessment, right? right. <laughs> you know, it started with a conversation, what are the top five? And I actually intentionally put digital formative assessment tools because I knew I, I, that's what I actually wanted to go and have because I'm going to be talking about it in uh, to my students, uh, my university students. And so I, you know, I want to make sure that I get as much as you know, things out there and I, and I don't forget anything, but it was interesting then as far as the conversations, then where do they actually lead? And really it just tells you, Hey, uh, if you're not sure if you're doing formative assessment, you should really look into that. I mean, that's something that's, we should all be doing and then using that data that we collect because these are just amazing apps and they do collect data. They tell us, Hey, our kids either understand or they don't understand, but then we can use that to actually change our instruction. And if you're doing that, then you're doing formative assessment. If you're just giving, you know, you're just using Kahoot or Quizlet or any of these other things every once in a while, just as an activity, just to do it, but you're not doing anything with the information that you've collected, basically the, the understanding, whether your kids understand or not the concepts that you're trying to present, then it's not really formative assessment. You're just playing some games and and so really look into that and make sure that if you're interested in this that yeah you're using them for for that purpose and like someone even mentioned hey just remember that you can also use paper and pencil and i totally agree sometimes that's that's a great way to go you know you don't need to go digital and then at the end um at the end of the day here today um someone you work with drop the mic i feel like um, I can't remember her name. Uh, and she's married to, yeah, she's married to Paul. Stephanie Schlungen is her name. Yep. And she, and I'm trying to find the tweet and I should have had it saved, but it was like everything. Do you, do you have it up? Do you remember <laughs> what she said? Oh, yeah. So I, I, I put that cause there was a guy, his name is Ryan Horn. And he said, he said, I find we need to spend about 50% of the training on tools and the other 50% on how to use tools in a formative manner is exactly what I just finished talking about because he says, otherwise these things get used as summative assessments. So like end of unit things. So a summative thing would be a final assessment. Um, and I just put right here, I was like, Oh, this is exactly what we were just talking about. Steph. That formative assessment is not an event. It's a continuous process. Oh, so good. And that was it. I know. Conversation over. <laughs> Cut. Uh, I mean, it was it was it. That that was exactly what you know. I'm glad that we got there. Yes. Um, out of all of those, com and it went in like some weird directions. I almost picked a fight with a dude who talked about who talked about like monetization of ed tech companies, and I was like, I'm not even going to bother because I could derail this really quickly. Um, <laughs> Right. <laughs> but I, I'm so so I am really happy that in the end, that's where that's where I felt like that was like the appropriate ending to like a day of really interesting ideas and like concepts and tweets and and people sharing. 
Um, so, uh, you know, it is a continuous process and it does not necessarily require digital tools. Um, yes. You can literally just talk to your kids, heaven forbid. And that is formative assessment. Um, and it's not something you do once. It's something you do all of the time. Yes. Um, and we can all be better, I think, at formative assessment in the end. Uh, so that's where we'll that's where we'll leave that. We'll we'll put uh, our top five in the show notes, and I'm yes. sure that this will end up in the blog this week, so you can read about it and click on links to uh, to explore those tools. When we come back, we'll be joined by one of my favorite people in the world, Mayor Cernovac. So stay with us. On Education is brought to you by Fidgets. Fidgets are interactive USB sensors that support all major programming languages that make physical computing easy. Fidgets keep the emphasis on coding while increasing student engagement. And the best part is that you can get started for free right now. Simply go to bit.ly slash Fidgets on Education to get your introductory kit that includes a free sensor worth over $50. That's bit.ly slash Fidgets on Education. Welcome back to the podcast, everyone. It's it's hard to be engaged in Edu Twitter and not come across our next guest. Never short on opinions, and frankly, the hottest takes in education. Mayor Cernovac is an education and professional development consultant. Welcome to On Education, Mayor. So good to be here, finally. So good to have you finally. <laughs> so um, so before we get started, um. I, I thought I thought about this the other day. I can count, I think, other than my wife and kids, I think that there are maybe five people that I talk to every day, and two of them I'm staring at on my screen right now. So, like... <laughs> I live I, for I, a good Washburn check-in. No, it's... There's, because we <laughs> always have something to say to each other. You know what I mean? There's always, right. It's quick, and it's simple, and it's hilarious. But, no, I, I look forward yeah. to our daily our daily talks. There are very few people I talk to every day, and Glenn and Mayor are definitely uh, two of them. Um, so, Mayor, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about what you do, who you are, and all that jazz. Okay. Um, I was a – well, I didn't really start out in teaching 25 years ago. I was in the corporate world um, as a corporate trainer and a recruiter and then stayed home to have my kids and then decided to get my master's in education and my master's in special ed and taught um, for 10 years as an elementary school teacher, mostly in fifth grade, but I've taught all the grades. Um, I just felt like I was good in fifth grade. I didn't feel like I was good in any other grade. Um, and then moved on to our state department of education. I was the director of professional learning. Um, and now I do some consulting on the East Coast mainly very close to New Jersey between DC, Baltimore, um, New York state. And then I do coaching as well. Fantastic. So I've already checked in with you guys that neither of you have heard of hot ones. So, so this is the YouTube channel um, where they do, they interview people. And the first off the interviewer is fantastic. Everyone should go watch this YouTube channel where they're eating chicken wings and, and, and talking about whatever the person is, um, that's being interviewed. They're talking about them, but the wings get progressively hotter. So it's supremely entertaining. Oh, and so for example, they've had Al Alton Brown was a guest once and he's like analyzing the taste and yeah. style of the wings and sauce, right. As Alton Brown would do. Right. He had um, what's his name? The other, the English chef, the the guy that's a douchebag. What's his oh. name again? Ramsey. Ramsey, Gordon, Gordon Ramsey. Ramsey. Yeah, so Gordon. Ramsey was on and was like assessing the chicken wings, and you know, okay, so that all prefaces the idea for this interview. This is different than we've done before. So what we've done, because because there's no one on Twitter better than Mayor. <laughs> So, so what on Edu Twitter, anyways? So, what I've done is we went through um, Mare's Twitter feed mm -hmm. and and research. We did we did legit research for this interview, um, I, and I I found I went through all of her tweets with over five hundred likes and pulled about fifteen of them. We narrowed it down to about five or six, and we're gonna read them back to her. 
and then she's going to talk about them and then we'll talk about it if we have anything else to say um and and i'm i'm super excited about these tweets they get me excited uh and they're they're freaking awesome so so and and i mean everyone else thinks they're awesome too because you know i mean they they're they're, they get giant amounts of likes and retweets and all of that jazz so here we go are you ready you ready ready. for this yeah i'm excited (laughs) (laughs) this is exciting exciting times okay tweet number one yeah Dear elementary school teachers, if you assigned my daughters an elaborate at-home project, I did it for them. You graded my work. Now let's talk about equity and homework. Mm. This tweet, I thought it was just simple. And the responses became not simple. Um, yeah. My intention for the tweet was I spoke all of my tweets are triggered from either something I see on Twitter, hear from a friend, or someone DMs me. So I have a lot yeah. of people in my DMs that'll say, this happened, or this, can you believe this? So it'll kind of like get me thinking. This one, I saw um, something posted about these at-home projects, and it was someone proud of them. And they were cute. They were adorable. Sure, yeah. And it bothered me because when we talk about homework, and we hand out homework, we hand out these big out at home projects. The bottom line is parents try to be involved if they're home. When they're not home, they run around trying to put it together or the kid who doesn't have that help do. puts it together themselves. And yep. then you bring them all into the same classroom and you assess them on the exact same rubric or whatever sort of assessment you're gonna assess them on. And you have no idea the environment that they were completed in. This is how I feel about homework, projects, anything that is done in the house. I'm not against it. It should not be graded. (laughs) And you should understand that you have no idea the supports that the child has or does not have. Um, And the response to it was, you know, you're ridiculous for doing your kids' homework and my kids do their own projects and this is the problem with people like you. And it was like, they're lying first right? off and, and straight up. <laughs> my, so your response, straight up. My, your response was my favorite because I remember you putting, I don't know if it was Isaac's, it, someone's project. It was right? Isaac's so project. Yeah, hundred percent. Like I work so hard on this. That's yeah, the thing. Exactly. Like, my tweets. First of all, this is Twitter. Let's not get that serious. I'm bringing up some serious topics, but It isn't that I don't want to engage. I want you to stay focused. Read my last sentence again. We're talking about equity. When you send an at-home project, there is no way that you can score it on an equitable basis. And that was the point of that tweet. I still stand by that 100%. I don't write my... There is no no equity in homework. None. Absolutely not. And I'm not against it. Do I see a... Absolutely, I see a benefit if a child wants to read. Um, can you assign it and, and force it and hope that it's, you know, organic and, and doing what it needs to? No, you can't. And you can give math practice and that might help a child, but to score it when they come back home, that's what, I mean, when they come back to school, that's the only thing I'm talking about that you cannot The craziest do. thing was I, I taught, so I taught computer science in Richmond Hill, Ontario, which is a suburb of Toronto and it's just dominated by computer programmers and doctors and lawyers basically at a private school and so i had half of my class that were kids of computer programmers and i had half of my class that were kids of doctors dentists and lawyers basically so i had half the class in my computer science class whose parents absolutely were like hands-on with their programming anything that they needed help with they could help with and then i had half the class that just their parents didn't have a clue what was like what to do so I thought I didn't I didn't do any homework because it was it was ridiculous. Like you right. said, there's no equity there, right? At all. And I, and so yeah, and I did it when I started. It wasn't until you start. That's why Twitter is a beautiful thing. I think when you start meeting other people and then you start reading. I have made even when I started Twitter a year ago, I would tweet things where I look back now and cringe because I just didn't know. Like, no, that's really a stupid thing to do, or that's not an educated. <laughs> like you know response so like I do a lot of reading homework has always been something though even if you asked anyone that has taught with me over 10 years I never gave it 
Like they knew yeah. kids coming into my class were excited because I didn't give it. I brought it up at back to school night. Parents trusted that they knew the kids that had come in before. I had so many siblings. I had parents request. So they knew it wasn't what I was doing in the classroom was good work. They knew their child would be enriched and loved and would learn the same things. They just were not going to get anything home at night. So there it is. Yeah. So one of the things that I really agree with you, and I'm, I'm actually going to ask you two questions that are kind of like softballs because I totally agree with this one. And this is a statement you make here uh, about test companies, which I love. Uh, the coolest part about test companies who tell you your kids are not proficient is that they yeah. somehow happen to have hundreds of products to sell to sell you to make sure that they are. I mean, this so, this is a go capitalism statement. <laughs> about, you know, the big testing companies, Pearson, all the time. As far as on the podcast, maybe some people think that we're bashing them too much. I think this is right on. This is exactly, and it, it's crazy, don't you think? It, it's insane how we don't just see it. It's right in front of us what's happening, but yet we just continue the cycle of, of letting basically the test companies rule us and run, run our everything that has to do with education, at least in the United States. What triggered that tweet was I was in, I was sitting in on a training. Um, it wasn't my training. I just happened to be there supporting some of the administrators and they were getting trained on testing and it was Pearson. And at one point they showed the scores and they said, now, you know, for interventions, we also offer this. And there was prices of these books. And I thought, <laughs> so I turned to the administrator, I go, give me the Lexile. I'll get you 10,000 of those books for free online. You don't have to buy that book, you know? And I think they knew oh, that, man. but at the same time, it all of a sudden it was a sales pitch. And I go, this is what they do. Yep. Pearson, Houghton Mifflin, they, they control the market. And then they control and then they create intervention programs online where we sit kids in front of computers because they can't read the books that Houghton Mifflin created. But they have an intervention program for that. And that'll cost you yeah. $50,000. You know, it's just that's the, that's the world we live in. You know what I mean? They, we create they, our diseases and then we cure them, too. And everybody we're say. not getting that money. Yeah, they they create garbage tests and then they give you a they give they charge you for the ways to solve you failing the garbage tests. And how interesting it is that our kids can't seem to master this test because if they did, they would be out of business. So I've seen those test questions, and as a forty-two year old woman with two master's degrees and has taught for years, I couldn't answer some of the questions on a fifth grade test. Yeah. I didn't know. I didn't know which one I was. You know what I mean? They're doing this is so calculated. I will not buy that they are in it for kids. They are in it for them. Except and they've created a task to weed kids. out. You know what I mean? This is how our education process works. Some kids will succeed, but they are banking on most of them not succeeding because they got something, a product for you. Jeez. That's it right there. That's it. <laughs> it's, That's it's the tweet. Tone. It's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. What a system we live in, man. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's the same in Ontario. We have EQAO, uh, which is a standardized Ontario test. And, mm -hmm. you know, we have the Pearson up here. I mean, they don't they don't administer the tests and stuff like that. But uh, um, I mean, no, it's a business. It's a business. They're not. But, they, they have shareholders that don't exactly give a right. damn about kids. No. In don't fact, most of the people no. regulating us don't give a damn about kids, you know, and that's the policies, that's the regulations, that's the mandates. The further you go away from the school, the the, the less anybody cares about this school. Because I've seen yeah. it, you know, it's just, it's ridiculous. Okay, so the next one, the, the train the trainer model does not work. If you want high quality PD, hire the experts that can provide it. Don't send two staff members from your school and hope they turn key it. Go all in or don't do any of it at all. This is people's life's work. It's not a gimmick. Yeah, I mean, for me, I'm coming out of a district where that was normal. Um, mm. You, First of all, most of the PD was brought in. We had our own staff development. Um, but if we were getting professional development, if there was something specific that we were getting, everybody was like one person was chosen per building. And then yeah. 
at times I remembered thinking like, hey, I know she went to the training. She never told us. And like it fell by the wayside all the time. Yeah. Either we got, yeah. you know, a half-assed training or we got no training. And the bottom line is if you look at the work that's the most important right now in schools, and I'm talking about um, work around anti-racism and equity. You, there are people that are experts in this work. This is their life's work. The research, the studies, bring, spend the money and bring these folks into your district so that people can hear it, ask questions, be a part of this active learning environment. Um, I think what also happens in schools with train the trainer models is the teachers that go um, aren't always the best. They, first of all, I do PD. You have to know yeah. how to do PD, and not every teacher it's, can do it. You know, we say is, we say it all the time. Most most PD sucks. Right. There is a process. You have to understand yeah. the difference between children and adults. It isn't mm -hmm. the same type of learning, and you are not. That's why I always talk about this nonsense of icebreakers and games during adult learning. That's they're not kids, and they. Yeah. they Time is respected, and when you're bringing in people where this is their life's work, there is a, a dynamic in the room and an energy in the room that cannot be replicated by a couple of teachers going off and trying to come back and act it out. It's like me going to Broadway, and I could afford the ticket and coming back to my whole family and trying to recreate a Broadway show to let them know. Let me tell you all about how funny Book of Mormon was. <laughs> I just saw Beetlejuice and it was hilarious. Um, but that's the thing. This let bring the good <laughs> people in. You know, and if you're gonna do PD in your district, it has to be interactive yeah. and it has to be inclusive. Um, you know, and there's a lot of hurt feelings involved with the two people that get to go. I mean, there's just too many dynamics involved that screw Tons. it up. You know, PD shouldn't be a game of telephone. No, 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 PD should not be a game of telephone. That's right. exactly it. I, I've seen so many sides of this that it's not even funny. First, I, I, I remember clearly going on a trip to Boston for a, a conference, and there was the group of teachers that went on the trip, and there was the group of teachers that didn't go on the trip, oh, and there was animosity between oh, those two groups of teachers. Because yeah. going to Boston when you're from, like, southern ontario that's a big trip and you know we had nice we had nice yes we had nice dinners we had a good time we you know everything was paid for mm -hmm. and it was like you know what about me what am i not a good teacher am i not worth it you know we had there was all of those conversations and the people will be more focused on sneering and i'm not saying that always yeah. happens but let's be honest it's just you're hurt. So you don't even want to listen yeah. when the PD comes back to you because yeah. you're yeah. for the first time and it just doesn't work. The other side of that that's super interesting and, a, and a, a crazy dynamic for me personally was that I was dying for my own professional development. I was desperate right. for it yeah. um, when I was teaching. Um, and I knew that I needed something that was a little different than what some of the other people were getting in terms of professional development. So I was, I, I won't lie, and I think my response to this tweet was me talking about dying to go to conferences right. and saying, hey, I'll come back and teach the teachers what I learned. I Just please let me go. For the love of God, I need to go and learn something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it was hard because I, well, I totally agree with this tweet completely that training the trainer sucks. It was, it was how I was getting. Right. It's how I was trying to get my own professional development. Right. It's, it was such a double-edged sword. I knew it wasn't ideal, but I'm also doing what I had to do, or I felt like I had to do for me. Well, um, a lot of the it makes it complicated. That, yeah, and that was a lot of the backlash on that tweet of, you know, we, you know, we're, you know, this is how we go and get our PD and we want to do, and I, and I get that. And, and that's the thing with these tweets. I'm, I'm trying to talk about this utopian sort of ideal I know that this is how it goes and I'm not trying to take PD. If that's your only option as a district, it's great for the two of you that get to go. It's not great for the 150 yeah. of them sitting in the gym, listening to the two of you when you come back. It's great for the two yeah. of you and that's it. So you have another amazing tweet and I call it amazing just because I totally 100% agree with it. This and a Glenn. lot of people actually this disagree Glenn. with me on this one. And it's the it's it's very simple tweet. It says, 
teachers should not have to pay teachers. <laughs> and then you also put in parentheses, tag a resource or lesson to help each other out. Um, and I love that action uh, step about it too, not just just the statement. I've said this so many times in so many different ways. What brought out this specific tweet? Well, I wanted to start, so I was on Glisten's website. I was trying to put some things together for LGBTQ curriculum um, and realized how many resources were on there. And I felt like I was reinventing the wheel and I was trying to write a, re- um, a reading lesson for a third grade class. And I'm like looking for books and all this. And I go on Glisten and I thought, oh, I had no idea this was here. So I started that thread because I found threads on Twitter that to me were incredible resources that I could like pull from and, and bookmark and just have in class. So I thought, let me start one. And I knew that saying teachers should not have to pay teachers was going to stir the thread up a bit. So I was a little bit calculating when I wrote it, but I am adamant that teachers should not have to pay teachers. And there are so many free resources. This is the tweet that's pinned on my profile. And it is the tweet that I leave up there because I didn't start it to get followers or likes. I started it because I really wanted to build hundreds of resources for teachers. And that's what we did. Um, It still gets added to today. It still gets shared and people will tag their resources. And I've used that thread. Um, But you know, let's be honest, teachers pay teachers is a, a, a dumpster fire. And, you know, between the the cute little gimmicky cartoon, you know, kids that you throw in the corner. Um, mm-hmm. I have used teachers pay teachers before out of desperation because it's easy. And it's easy for me as a, not a teacher now to say it's garbage, guys, because I've been in the room and had nothing and panicked and needed something and I was willing to pay whatever for it. The thread was to highlight, you don't need to do that. There are things out there for free and they're vetted. And that's the difference when an organization puts some resources out. These are researchers, these are experts behind these vetted products on Teachers Pay Teachers. We have seen this year especially simulations of events that have happened in history that are should not be turned into simulations in a classroom and these gimmicks i mean i saw one the other day it was um it was on martin luther king and it was a word search with words that i don't think kids should be searching first of all there's no value of a word search anyway let's be honest but it was gimmick it was gimmick for a man that that changed this world and struggled through some horrific times and now he's a cartoon waving to kids and um racism was in a word so i mean what what are we doing right um it's just tacky and and there are some things on there that are just not good for kids you know and someone who understands literacy especially i've seen resources on there that are just pure garbage that people are charging you know 5.99 for so there are 265 replies yeah. on that thread. That's like, you know, so people, you know, we'll, we'll link that, that tweet specifically yeah. in the show notes uh, because, you know, if you're looking for resources, I mean, that might be a pretty damn good place to start, to be exactly. perfectly honest. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of takes about, about, you know, TPT and, about sharing and equity and all of that stuff. So there are just a, some opinion tweets in there, of course. Yeah, but and you're- there are, I'm scrolling through it right now, and there are a truckload of resources. And I love what you said about them being vetted. These yeah. are resources that people that, you know, that we know um, yeah. that are saying, use this. You're talking about um, teaching tolerance, about Zen Ed. You're talking about Glisten. There are so many organizations out there that produce quality resources um, that are free because they want this to infiltrate classrooms instead of the garbage that is in classrooms. And it's really good stuff. I use it constantly. Um, So, and that's the thing. And, you know, the flack was, you know, we need to make money. And I'm like, I'm not take, go make your money. (laughs) You know what I mean? I'm, and I remember retweeting that. And I thought what was so confusing was the, the hate for people screaming about teachers need to make money 
when I made a thread so teachers don't have to spend money. And I thought, oh, I'm missing, I'm missing that a, a totally, but. Also completely missing the point. How about we pay teachers more? Yes. But, and that's the yeah. thing, you know, and I think <laughs> I mean... tweets have these bigger, you know, I even tweeted something today. There was, you know, of course the point was missed, but I'm trying to bring a conversation to a bigger bigger issue here you know so i talked yeah. about a district throwing away smart boards into a dumpster but saying they can't give their teachers raises and then people were like i like smart boards and i'm like mm, not the point buddy i i'm talking about the wasteful spending in education i just want us to start talking um and sometimes yeah. you know that that's what happens let's just talk about it i Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. That's that's Glenn's wheelhouse right there. Glenn Glenn has had many we I mean many, many times. How many, how, how many times yeah. have we talked on the podcast? I think we talked about teachers pay teachers last week. We should start doing a count of how many times TPT gets referenced because <laughs> free advertisement. Free yeah. advertising. Imagine imagine TPT sponsored on education. <laughs> the people would be like I couldn't even read that ad. That'd be burn the podcast to the ground. <laughs> It'd be over. That'd be the That'd end be, of us. That would be bad. <laughs> well, they, they all right. This new thing. I was on it. Um, I don't know. Someone linked something, and I went on, and their homepage was like, "Start a TPT fund, like a GoFundMe TPT, so you can just someone Sometimes. can fund you to spend all of the money on TPT things." And I thought, "Oh yeah. God, it's yeah. putting a silk hat on a pig." At that point, I'm glad you touched it because I wasn't going to. I just it was too Happy much. To. This one's probably my favorite. Uh, no, I'm not going to pick favorites. I like all of these, but this one's, this one's good. And, um, um, I wasn't going to add this one, but after that, so the Canadian election was, was last night. Um, and, um, the, obviously the American, uh, prime, the democratic primary is going on and you are very opinionated politically. I am very opinionated politically and Glenn is pretty opinionated politically. So, so there's no, lack of opinions on politics in this uh in this channel in this uh in this conversation right. dear teachers your job is political mm -hmm. your stance cannot be neutral staying out of it is not a position it's blatant anger ig Ugh, i'm gonna read that one again you got it Dear teachers, your job is political. Your stance cannot be neutral. Staying out of it is not a position. It's blatant ignorance. You are in a job that is mandated by policies and regulations that are coming on a state and local level. Law, written law. They are voted upon. Um, they are. You have to follow it. Our state standards are clear. Your, your curriculum is mandated. Everything is political. There are elected people involved in that. So right off the bat, you are in a political position. If you're involved in a union and paying union dues, that is political. And I got sick and tired of, now, first of all, I'll talk about politics in terms of the Democratic primary. Um, I'm obviously like a staunch liberal. So that, I bleed that. But, you know, here in America right now, we are just at this precipice of something really big happening. So it's very hard for us to not talk politics. But so many times I've had people say, I stay away from it. I don't want to touch it. I don't want to bring it into my classroom. And I thought, how do you teach anything with politics not being a part of it? The fifth grade science, and this came from an elementary school teacher. The fifth grade science curriculum in the state of New Jersey, the overarching theme is human impacts on Earth. The biggest impact we have made on Earth is the global crisis. How are you not talking about that? That isn't political. It's a scientific fact. And in this mm -hmm. country, what we have done is decided that that's a left, that that's a left leaning right, opinion. Right. Yeah. It's science. I don't know what happened to science, but something happened over the past two years in this country where we decide that what our opinions are is based on our party lines now and opinions that I, I think we almost forget how to think for ourselves. Um, so that's the thing. So much of what we do inside of our classroom is driven by politics. The things that affect our children, the inequities inside of the school building are driven by politics. 
as much as New Jersey is one of the most diverse states in the country, we are number six in school segregation. And that is political. Where the money goes is political. These schools failing is political. Like, mm-hmm. and, and that really, you have to be active in it. If you want to do things for kids, you have to be active in the politics that dictate what's happening inside and outside of your schools. It isn't an option not to. And if you don't, then go, leave. This isn't the job for you. This job is bigger than it was 30 years ago, and we're not making Santa beards with cotton balls anymore. We're in a fight, and they're taking away everything that is good, and we have to hold on to something. And you can do little things. You can stuff envelopes or send letters or or do something where maybe you don't want to have a big mouth, but you have to be involved in making some sort of systemic change. Otherwise, what is the point of what we're doing? This isn't this nine to three job and teaching science and math and reading and writing. This is really caring about these kids and their future and what will affect them. And that is politics, point blank. Uh, I, I've been on a couple interviews lately where I've been asked about the podcast and uh, I've been starting to, because I, I, I spent some time thinking through how I wanted to respond to stuff like this. Mm. And uh, because I, I think that we are, Glenn and I, you know, we're talking about this stuff and a lot of people aren't. Uh, right. And so, you know, I've started to, to say, you know, everyone else is talking about the politics of education. Everyone is. The right. politicians are, the, the lobbyists are, the everyone is. Everyone is talking about the politics of education except for educators. That's it. Because we're afraid to for some reason. Um, because, you know, so even though, you know, it's almost like they feel like this isn't their lane, even though this is completely educators' lane. We should be talking about the politics of education. And, and, and I think... And don't play it safe with the Betsy DeVos nonsense. Betsy DeVos has absolutely no impact on your school. It is low. 92% of school funding is local and state level. That yes, woman is, a, yes. is an idiot, but she is not impacting. So sometimes I see the tweets and I'm like, that's a safe tweet. We all know who Betsy DeVos is. Stop, keep going local because you have someone impacting those policies and mandates that are driving your school. And it's not her. There's a reason your school funding is low. There's a reason that your kids aren't going to prom because their school lunch debt isn't paid. And it's not Betsy DeVos's fault. I'll tell you that right now. It's your board. And it's the people that you are voting for. It's real close to home. So I just feel like, you know, I don't even want to play it on that national level. You know, get involved in your board of ed. You know, go to a meeting, vote, you know, vote, get put a lawn sign out. Politics can be small and they can be mm-hmm. little tight, you know, it has to be. but But stay involved and listen, you know, don't just put your, you know, these blinders on and say, nope, that's not for me. That's not the world we live in anymore. Like we are, we are fighting to the death at this point. We sure are. Um, This has been a ton of fun. Uh, You know, uh, keep, keep doing what you're doing. These, these are awesome takes. This is, these are strong opinions. And I think that what you're doing and what you're talking about resonates with a ton of people, um, in, including me. And even if it's just, even if you're just tweeting to me, I'm fine with that too. I would, I would uh, be happy to just tweet to you, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mer, share with everyone how people can get in touch with you, reach out with to you, connect with you in whatever ways that you want them to. I mean, most of my world lives on Twitter right now. Um, so I am at Mayor underscore from underscore New Jersey. Um, I have so many people that reach out in my DM, sometimes for interview advice, which I love to give. I am a coach and I'm really... Sp- specifically a literacy coach. So like lessons or ideas or anything in terms of if you have an observation coming up and you want advice on, I'm happy to do that. And I'm happy to just listen to you event. Um, you know, and I think that, and Mike knows, I mean, some of my closest friends right now came from that app, you being one of them. And um, I'm always open to anyone that wants to have this conversation or to reach out and I'm an independent consultant. I am allowed to say things that a year ago I was not allowed to say. And if I can speak for all of us and and a lot of people DM me things that I tweet nuanced from that. But um, yeah, that's how you can that's how you can reach me. Mayor Cernovac, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. 
Thanks for listening to On Education. My name is Glenn Irvin. My co-host is Mike Washburn. On Education is part of the Education Podcast Network. You can listen to this show and many others by great educators like Jennifer Gonzalez, Matt Miller, and many more by visiting edupodcastnetwork.com. Want to get in touch with us? Check out our website at oneducationpodcast.com. You can tweet us at oneducationpod. Mike is at Mr. Washburn on Twitter, and I can be found at Irv Spanish. You can find us on Facebook by visiting facebook.com slash oneducationpod. We're also on Instagram at oneducationpod. If you're enjoying the show and think others would too, we would be thrilled if you shared it with them. Please leave us a rating or review in Apple Podcasts or the Google Play Store. When you leave a rating, it gives our rankings a boost. This helps others discover the show. We want to thank our presenting sponsor, Classcraft, for supporting us. Check out classcraft.com slash oneducation to learn more about them. Thanks as always for listening. Stay awesome and see you soon.